namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa so we're going to continue with our study of the mahaparinibbana sutta the sutta of the buddha's last days Diganakaya 16, and we're into the, the second section now. We're following the Buddha as he wanders through um, northern India, making like his last tour. The Lord said to Ananda, let us go to Kotagama. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Kotagama and stayed there. Then the Lord addressed the monks thus, Monks, it is through not understanding, not penetrating the Four Noble Truths, that I, as well as you, have for a long time run on and gone round the cycle of birth and death. What are they? By not understanding the Noble Truth of suffering, we have fared on. By not understanding the Noble Truth of the origin of suffering or the cessation of suffering and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, we have fared on round the cycle of birth and death. And by the understanding, the penetration of the same noble truth of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of cessation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the craving for becoming has been cut off. The support of becoming has been destroyed. There is no more re-becoming. So as, as uh, last time, The Buddha is giving final teachings everywhere he goes to the different communities of, of monks and sometimes of lay people. And here he's discoursing on the noble truths, which of course was his very first teaching. And it's by not understanding the noble truths that we end up wandering in samsara. By understanding the noble truths, the craving for further existence is cut off. The Lord having said this, the welfare having spoken, the teacher said, not seeing the four noble truths as they are, having long traversed the round from life to life, these being seen, becoming supports pulled up, sorrow's root cut off, rebirth is done. So this, uh, this, uh, short stanza is in verse in the Pali. And the Lord, while staying at Kotagama, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Sila Samadhi Panya. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions, the asawas. That is, the corruption of sensuality, the corruption of becoming, the corruption of false view, and the corruption of ignorance for asawas. Sensuality, becoming, false views, and ignorance. The comprehensive discourse is one that covers the entire teaching from beginning with the with sila keeping precepts leading all the way up to wisdom and liberation and we saw this last time that he gives um as he goes he gives this comprehensive discourse in many places when the lord had stayed at kotagama as long as he wished he said ananda let us go to nadaka very good lord said ananda and the lord went with a large company of monks to nadaka where he stayed at the brick house and the Venerable Ananda came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side, and said, Lord, the monk Salha and the nun Nanda have died at Nadika. What rebirth have they taken after death? The lay follower Sudatta and the lay woman follower Sujata, the lay followers Kakuda, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tuta, Santuta, Bada, and Subada have all died at Nadaka, what rebirths have they taken? Ananda, the monk Salha, by destruction of the corruptions, 
attained in this life through his own super knowledge, the uncorrupted liberation of mind, the liberation by wisdom. So that means he became an arahant. The nun Nanda, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. So she became a Anagami. We have this system of um, the four stages of enlightenment and the ten fetters. And the five lower fetters are destroyed by a Anagami. And they're, uh, the name Anagami means non-returner. So they never return to existence in this uh, uh, level of existence, but are reborn in the Sudawasa, the Pure Lands, where they uh, eventually attain Nibbana after a shorter or longer time. The lay follower Sudatta, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion, is a once-returner, and he will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. The once-returner Sakadagami, they have destroyed the uh, the first three fetters, that is, the, the ones that are destroyed by a Sotapanna, that is, uh, personality view, right and ritual, clinging, and skeptical doubt. And they've attenuated the two middle fetters of uh, sensuality and ill will. And then that they become what's called the Sakadagami, or once returner. And such a person is only reborn human one more time. The lay woman follower Sujata, by the destruction of three fetters, is a stream winner incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. Well, a stream winner, incapable of falling into the states of woe, means they, they, a stream winner never takes rebirth lower than the human. They never become uh, reborn as an animal or in hell or as a ghost. And one of the phrases that's sometimes um, expressed by someone in the suttas who attains to stream entry, one of the things they say is, the gates of hell are shut for me. The lay follower Kakuda, by destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without retaining to the world. Likewise, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tuta, Santuta, Bada, and Subada. Ananda, in Nadaka, more than 50 lay followers have, by the destruction of the lower five fetters, been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to the world. Rather more than 90, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion, are once returners, and will come back once more to this world and make an end of suffering. And well over 500, by the destruction of three fetters, are stream winners, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. Ananda. It is not remarkable that that which has come to be as a man should die, but that you should come to the Tathagata to ask the fate of each of those who have died, that is a weariness to him. You know, I don't, don't bother me with this stuff anymore. Yeah. Therefore, Ananda, I will teach you a way of knowing Dhamma called the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Orion disciple, if he so wishes, can discern of himself, I have destroyed hell, animal rebirth, the realm of ghosts, all downfall, evil states and sorry states. I am a stream winner, incapable of falling into the states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. And what is this mirror of Dhamma by which he can know this? Here, Ananda, the Orion disciple is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha thus. This blessed Lord is Arahant, fully enlightened Buddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct, the welfare, knower of the worlds, incomparable trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. Do we, we recognize this, uh, this passage? This is the, uh, what we chant. This is the tipito, uh, tipiso bhagawa arahang. This is, uh, this is the translation of it. So it's called the mirror of the Dhamma because they, it goes through the three jewels and uh, the one who has attained stream entry has unwavering confidence or 
could also be said perfect faith in the three jewels. So he is possessed of unwavering faith in the Dhamma. Thus, well proclaimed by the Lord is the Dhamma, visible here and now, timeless, inviting introspection, leading onwards to comprehend to be comprehended by the wise, each one for himself. He is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha. Thus, well directed is the Sangha of the Lord's disciples, of upright conduct on the right path, on the perfect path, that is to say the four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of humans. The Sangha of the Lord's disciple is worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, worthy of gifts, worthy of veneration, an unsurpassed field of merit to the world. And the last point for a mirror of the Dhamma, and he is possessed of morality dear to the noble ones unbroken, without defect, unspotted, without inconsistency, liberating, uncorrupted, and conducive to concentration. So, um, in another passage, the, uh, the Buddha expands on that a little bit. He says that for one who is a stream winner, it might be possible for them to break a precept in a minor way, but they immediately pull back from it and they know they've done wrong. It's like if you touch a hot stove and you're, you pull your hand back. So the, uh, because the stream winner is never reborn lower than human, they, they never commit any kama that would lead to them taking a lower rebirth. This is a Theravada understanding of um, the enlightened, of course, for, for an arahant, say, that his behavior is absolutely flawless. This understanding of the effect of awakening or enlightenment on moral behavior is different from Theravada, from some of the, the Vajrayana ideas of uh, crazy wisdom. You know, and, and both would say that you know the um, enlightened person is beyond the morality and the precepts. But in the Theravada tradition, it's because they live perfectly. They, they would never consider to break a precept, so they don't need precepts. They just naturally live that way. But in the Vajrayana, they have some tradition of um, enlightened masters who commit all kinds of breaches of precept because they're, they get away with it because they, they are enlightened. And so they, they're kind of operating on a different level. So it's... It's a different, uh, certainly I think the Theravada way is more benign. You don't have this. Um, I know one of our monks says, uh, you know, we don't have crazy wisdom in our tradition. We just have wise wisdom. And the, another point to comment on is uh, in the description of the attributes of the Sangha, the four pairs, the eight kinds of beings. This has been uh, some discussion of uh, interpretation of this. The um, commentarial explanation is what it means is that there's four levels of enlightenment and each level has two stages, path and fruit. But that's kind of problematic as an interpretation if you are um, uh, going to take the, uh, the Abhidhamma understanding of how the stages of how the, the mind states leading to enlightenment work is there there is when a, a person's coming up to enlightenment there's two it is a two-step process there's path and fruit path is maga is when the eightfold path comes together perfectly at the transcendental level at lokutara level and that's considered the last comma effective moment. And then the very next moment is the fruit moment, pala, which is the realization of nibbana. And that's a resultant moment. So you have this one, two process. But if you're looking at them as individuals, it doesn't really make a kind of, it doesn't make intuitive sense to say there's these eight kinds of beings because it, at any given moment in the in the world since that 
according to the Abhidhamma interpretation, the Maga only lasts for a single my moment. You know, what's the odds that there's anybody at this moment when you're chanting that who's at that that point? Right? It's pretty vanishingly small. So there has been, and that's the kind of a commentarial official interpretation of it. Other people have interpreted, you know, later trying to make sense of it, saying that um, the pairs might be monks and nuns, or or lay lay people and 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 uh, ordained people, or you know, trying to parse it some other way. But it is it is a curious phrase. So the the mirror of the Dhamma is the perfect faith in Buddha Dhamma Sangha and these attributes, and then the uncorrupted, undefiled morality. This Ananda is the mirror of the Dhamma, whereby the Orion disciple can discern from herself, himself, I have destroyed hell, I am a stream winner, certain of attaining Nibbana. Then the Lord, staying at Nadaka in the brick house, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. And when the Lord had stayed at Nadaka as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to Vesali, where he stayed at Ampabali's grove. Now we're going to meet this person soon. Ampabali is a famous courtesan. Uh, she the name means um, the the mango woman because uh, she was found as a baby abandoned in a mango grove and raised and uh, she turned out to be a, such an extraordinarily beautiful woman that all the um, the princes and nobles were vying to marry her so the king to to avoid all the trouble and disputes he made her the royal courtesan uh, which is kind of a, a an honor a p position it's it's kind of like um ancient greece they had hetary and uh, japan had geishas it's not like a low class prostitute it's it, it was sort of a, a a very considerable position to be in the 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 the, the royal uh, courtesan you know so she had her her um her house and she had you know other girls working for her and it said that she would her her price was forty mahakapanas a night, which is a huge fortune. Uh, a mahakapana is a hundred kahapanas, and one kahapana is about the the wages that a skilled workman would make in a day. So you can kind of work it out. That's a lot of a lot of money. Eventually, and you know the uh, after you know after this after the Buddha died. And, Later on, she eventually um, became uh, converted to uh, uh, serious. Like she was already uh, at this time; she was already a follower of the Buddha. But she became, you know, a serious and um, uh, ordained as a nun, and eventually attained arahantship. And she has a one of the poems in the Terigat is attributed to her. And then the Lord addressed the monks. Monks, a monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. And how is a monk mindful? A monk abides contemplating the body as body, earnestly, clearly aware, mindful and having put away hankering and fretting for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind and mind objects. This is how a monk is mindful. And how is a monk clearly aware? So this, this is Sati and Sampajanya. And this is a... Uh, this couple of paragraphs is a short version of the Satipatthana Sutta. And how is the monk clearly aware? Here a monk, when going forward or backwards, is aware of what he is doing. And looking forward or backwards, he is aware of what he is doing. In bending and stretching, he is aware of what he is doing. In carrying his inner and outer robe and bowl, he is aware of what he is doing. In eating, drinking, chewing and savoring, he is aware of what he is doing. In passing excrement or urine, he is aware of what he is doing. In walking, standing, sitting or lying down or keeping awake. In speaking or staying silent, he is aware of what he is doing. That is how a monk is clearly aware. A monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. It's a 
commentarial note that the Buddha gave this particular teaching at this moment to the monks about mindfulness because he, he knew they were going to be in the company of Ampabali very soon. And he was like, telling the monks, you know, keep your mindfulness about you. Well, this is dangerous here. Now, Ampabali, the courtesan, heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali and was staying at her grove. She had the best carriage made ready and drove from Vesali to her park. She drove as far as the ground would allow and then alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was. She saluted the Lord and sat down to one side, and as she sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted her with a talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, Ampabali said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal for me tomorrow with his order of monks. The Lord consented by silence. And Ampabali, understanding his acceptance, rose from her seat, saluted the Lord, and passing him by to the right, departed. And the Lachavis of Vesali heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali and was staying at Ampabali's grove. The Lachavis are a can a clan of uh, Katya nobles, warrior nobles, part of the Vajian Confederacy. In the last uh, section, we we talked about the the Vajians and the uh, their war with the Magadans. That this was before the war broke out, of course. Uh, the and the uh, Lachavis were uh, renowned for uh, first of all their their wealth and 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 uh, splendor, but also for their martial prowess, that they were, particularly with archery. So although they were very rich and th they dressed in great finery, they weren't uh, soft and decadent. They were th they were still warrior nobles. So the uh, Lachawis had the, their best carriages made ready and drove out of Wesley, and some of the young Lachawis were all in blue, with blue makeup, blue clothes and blue adornment while well, some were in yellow, some in red, some in white, with white makeup, white clothes, and white adornment. And Ampabali met the young Lachawis, axle to axle, wheel to wheel, yoke to yoke. And they said to her, Ampabali, why do you drive up against us like that? Because, young sirs, the blessed Lord has been invited by me for a meal with his order of monks. Ampabali, give up this meal for a hundred thousand pieces. Young sirs, if you were to give me all of Vesali with all its revenues, I would not give up such an important meal. Then the Lachavi snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman. We've been cheated by the mango woman. And they set out for Ampabali's grove. So you can see these these folks were familiar with each other, and they were having a, there was a bit of, uh, it looks like friendly um uh, joshing going forth. She kind of rode her chariot up against theirs and kind of banged into the axle and said, ha, I've got the, I've got the Buddha to come to my place for a meal. You're out of luck. And the Lord, having seen the Lachavis from afar, he said to the monks, monks, any of you who have not seen the 33 gods, the Tawatinksa gods, just look at this troop of Lachavis. Take a good look at them and you will get an idea of the 33 gods. This is an expression both of their uh, the, their finery and their the the beauty of their 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 form. You know that they were dewa like in their in their appearance. Then the Lachawis drove in their carriage as far as the ground would allow. Then they alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was, saluted him, and sat down to one side. And as they sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted them with a the talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, they said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal with us tomorrow with his order of monks. But Lachavis, I have already accepted a meal for tomorrow from the courtesan Ampabali. Then the Lachavis snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman. We've been cheated by the mango woman. Then having rejoiced and delighted in his talk, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passing by on his right, departed. And Ampabali, when night was nearly over, having had choice hard food and soft food prepared at her home, announced to the Lord that the meal was ready. Having dressed and taken robe and bowl, the Lord went with the order of monks to Ampabali's residence and sat down on the prepared seat. And she served the Buddha and his monks with choice hard food and soft food till they were satisfied. And when the Lord had taken his hand from his bowl, 
Ampabali took a low stool and sat down to one side. So seated, she said, Lord, I give this park to the order of monks with the Buddha at its head. The Lord accepted the park, and then he instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted her with a talk on Dhamma, after which he rose from his seat and departed. Then, while staying at Waisali, the Lord delivered a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. So you see, he does this in each town he passes through. And when the Lord had stayed at Ampabali's grove as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to the little village of Baluva, where he stayed. Then the Lord said to the monks, You monks should go to anywhere in Vesali where you have friends or acquaintances or supporters and spend the rains there. I shall spend the rains here in Baluva. Very good, Lord, replied the monks. And they did so, but the Lord spent the rains in Baluva. And during the rains, the Lord was attacked by severe sickness. So it, you know, this is the beginning of the, the end here. The Lord was attacked with severe sickness, with sharp pain, as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully, clearly aware and without complaining. He thought, It is not fitting that I should attain final nibbana without addressing my followers and taking leave of the order of monks. I must hold this disease in check by energy and apply myself to the force of life. He did so, and the disease abated. Then the Lord, having recovered from his sickness, as soon as he felt better, went outside and sat on a prepared seat in front of his dwelling. Then the venerable Ananda came to him, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, I have seen the Lord in comfort. I have seen the Lord's patient enduring. And Lord, my body was like a drunkard's. I lost my bearings and things were unclear to me because of the Lord's sickness. The only thing that was some comfort to me was the thought, the Lord will not attain final nibbana until he has made some statement about the order of monks. But Ananda, what does the order of monks expect of me? I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer, that the Tagata has no teacher's fist in respect to the doctrines. The teacher's fist, meaning you know he doesn't hold his teachings back. There's no secret esoteric teachings. Every he's he uh, everything you need for enlightenment he openly teaches. If there is anyone who thinks I shall take charge of the order, or the order should refer to me now, let him make some statement about the order. But the Tathagata does not think in such terms. So why should the Tathagata make a statement about the order? Ananda, I am now old worn out, venerable, one who has traversed life's path. I have reached the term of life which is eighty. Just as an old cart is made to go by being held together with straps, so the Tathagata's body is kept going by being strapped up. It is only when the Tathagata withdraws his attention from outward signs and by the cessation of certain feelings into the signless concentration of mind that his body knows comfort. So the, the only time the Buddha was free of suffering, of, of physical pain, was when he went uh, into a deep states of deep samadhi. And this is, this is actually something that, that's good to know, that you can overcome physical pain with samadhi. It's worth having a look at this phrasing here. Uh, he withdraws his attention from the outward signs, you know, from the the uh, attention to the um, objects of the senses, by the cessation of certain feelings, that is, from uh, uh, worldly feelings, which would include pain in the body, you know, so he's withdrawing his attention from those things, he enters into the signless concentration of mind, that is, in Pali, that's animata ceto samadhi. Um, and it's not, it's not really explained even in the commentary exactly what that's taken to mean, but animata or signless is in the uh, Vasudhimaga, that's the name given for penetration into the nature of impermanence. That's the, uh, the signless liberation.
the animata, so without a sign. And Cheto Samadhi, well, Samadhi is that stillness of mind, translated as concentration. Cheto is um, the combining form of the word chitta, you know, it's consciousness. So uh, he entered into um, a signless state, animata, you know, which is attained by penetration of the nature of impermanence. So there's nothing to hold on to. Therefore, Ananda, you should live as islands unto yourself. Be your own refuge, with no one else as your refuge, with Dhamma as an island, with Dhamma as your refuge, with no other refuge. And how does a monk live as an island unto himself, with no other refuge? Here, Ananda, a monk abides contemplating the body as body, earnestly, clearly aware, mindful, and having put away all hankering and fretting for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind, and mind objects. So once again, that phrasing is exactly from the Satipatthana Sutta. It's the four bases of mindfulness, the body, feelings, the mind, and mind objects. And that phrasing about earnestly, clearly aware, putting aside hankering and fretting, etc., that's repeated in the Satipatthana Sutta. That Ananda is how a monk lives as an island unto himself with no other refuge. And those who now in my time or afterwards live thus will become the highest if they are desirous of learning. So that's the end of this section. <clears throat> we have the Buddha now, uh, the, the first um, overt signs of his uh, illness coming on, and he was able to make a conscious decision, I need to live a little bit longer to wrap up the affairs of the, the Sangha and make my final, give my final teachings. And he was able to um, hold on to his life principle. We'll see in a later section when he releases the, the life principle. This is something that um, I've been told is uh, the phrasing is found in in uh, Hindu books of the the, um, the idea of the, the 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 meditation master or yogi, someone who's who's got a, a mastery of, of yoga, has control of his life principle, and when when the time comes for him to die, he releases the life principle and dies consciously at a time of his own choosing. So the reverse of that would be also necessarily true, that the Buddha was able to prolong his life for some time to finish up his unfinished business. and then, But he knew his life was coming to an end and uh, he just wanted to get the, his final, uh, final last chance to address the monks in the different communities. So 